Okay, good evening, everyone. Karibuni uh, sana to today's uh, webinar hosted by the Kenya Society of Anesthesiologists. Uh, we are live from Nairobi, and I see we have international uh, representation. So karibuni sana. Uh, and many thanks to our participants uh, for making the time uh, to be with us this evening. Uh, today's webinar is made uh, possible by the kind support from BD Medical. And uh, we will be hearing from one of their representatives uh, later in the, in the webinar. So as usual, um, this session will be recorded. And uh, we'll ask that if you have any questions, you can, have, you can post them in the chat box and we will uh, address them once the presentation is made. Right. Uh, our presenter today is uh, Dr. David Waruingi. Uh, Dr. Waruingi is a uh, uh, Dr. Waruingi is an anesthesiologist uh, who has uh, who is an alumnus of uh, the Aga Khan University Hospital, Nairobi. He has previously worked at the Nairobi Hospital as a senior registrar. Uh, he has also recently completed uh, fellowships in the UK in uh, cardiothoracic anesthesia, and currently. He is a cardiothoracic uh, anesthetist, consultant anesthetist, uh, working at the Kenyatta University Teaching uh, Referral and Research Hospital. And we are very glad to have him on board today. So Dr. Waringi will take us through the principles of uh, total intravenous anesthesia. So this should make for a very interesting topic today. So Karibuni all and uh, Dr. Waringi, you can take it away. Uh, thank you, Tim, for that uh, colorful presentation, uh, introduction. Uh, my name is Waringi. I work in KU and uh, Tim is my colleague. And uh, thank you all for taking time to come out here. So I'll start with my presentation. So today we'll be talking about TIVA TCI use and I'll uh, give you the outline shortly. So that's the outline of my talk. Uh, I've split it into several topics. Um, from the introduction, why we use TIVA, and then the pharmacokinetics, which underpin the practice of TIVA really. Then I'll go dive into the systems and the models that are available, safety aspects, challenges with TIVA TCI use, and the possible future of this uh, technique. And then we'll conclude and I'll share some take home points. So, Briefly, I mean, uh, the default anesthetic technique most people use, myself included, is a balanced anesthetic, which includes use of a volatile and uh, plus or minus regional anesthetic. But TIVA use is slowly picking up and uh, it's been around for maybe the last 20 or so years. Uh, brief history of it is it started, the first TCI model was described by Schwellen in Bonn in Germany in 1981. But it's not until 1990 that uh, down south in South Africa, quite seen his colleagues developed the Stell pump, uh, which was an MS DOS uh, platform uh, kind of pump that was used to deliver anesthetics. And that was just manual infusion, that was total intravenous anesthesia tiva. Then in the late 1990s, Diprefusa developed a syringe pump. And it's not until the early 2000s in the Western world where now more models of TCI pump are developed. And now they are brand uh, related. There's BD, there's Fresenius and more. So by definition, TIVA, uh, TIVA is total intravenous anesthesia and TCI is target controlled infusions. It's maintenance of general anesthesia without the use of uh, any volatile. So why TIVA and why TCI? Why not just use a simple balanced anesthetic and crack on? It's because uh, most studies have said that people on TIVA and TCI, their quality of patient recovery is good. And there is some low quality data available uh, on patients who receive TCI having less cancer recurrence. There's also uh, environmental sustainability. Most of these volatiles pollute the air and cause ad uh, adverse effects. So if you use just a total intravenous anesthesia, there's more conservation of the environment. <clears throat> it's also very easy to provide anesthesia in remote locations via TIVA and TCI. And there's 
talk that there is rapid turnover if you use it uh, in daycare uh, surgery. There are no absolute indications uh, of using TIVA TCI. Uh, some of the indications are what I've listed here, uh, including things like teaching of trainees. Uh, it's used in neurosurgery to control uh, intracranial pressure. People with very severe post-op nausea and vomiting can benefit from this technique. Patients with a history of malignant hypothermia because we know volatiles trigger uh, MH, so you avoid them and you use TIVA and TCI. Patients in who you want to avoid using of relaxants, you can also use this technique. And as I insinuated before, in daycare surgery, it has a lot of uh, benefits. There's a NAP5 report, and uh, NAP5 is a national audit report that was done in the UK. It's normally, they normally do national audit reports to reflect on things that just basically an aesthetic practice. This NAP5 report was about accidental awareness during GA. And this is one of the major reasons why people have avoided using TIVA only and stuck to balance and aesthetic. So most of the self-reported causes of awareness were when TIVA were used. And they say that this was attributable to poor understanding of the pharmacokinetics underpinning this particular technique. And I want to touch base on this and that's why hopefully at the end of the talk, more and more people will be using TIVA TCI. So the pharmacokinetics, I'll split it into three. I'll talk about the major concepts that will help everybody uh, hopefully use this much more and more. So the context sensitive half time governs the drug choices that we use. So the graph that I've shared uh, shows on the X axis, I mean, shows the context sensitive half time. Context sensitive half time by definition is at the point where you stop an infusion, the plasma concentration of that drug dropping by 50%. So the most commonly ideal, quote unquote, TIVA drugs are propofol and remifentanil. So remifentanil is context insensitive. And on this graph, it's not shown, but it's normally very close, very close to the x-axis. Propofol, uh, after give or take like eight hours of infusion, you see if you stop it after eight hours of infusion, it only takes 40 minutes, which is called the decrement time, time to emerge and time to wake up to come up. Drugs like fentanyl are avoided in TIVA TCI. Reason being, after two hours of infusion, uh, of giving an infusion of fentanyl, it takes more than 250 minutes or more for a patient to wake up. So the drug choices for TIVA have to be one, having a short context sensitive half time, meaning that once you stop the infusion, waking up is quickly. And the drugs that fit this definition, ideally used worldwide, are propofol, and remifentanil. Alfentanil is starting to be used, but it's mainly used in ICUs in the West. The next pharmacokinetic concept to help understand uh, TIVA is compartmental modeling. So they are, these compartmental models is uh, just, they be help predict how a drug uh, gets distributed within the body. It's just a concept and it's just mathematical models of the body that are mere, I mean, more accurate, more, more accurate than looking at the body like a single container. So the diagram that I've just put up, all TCI models currently available in the market base uh, their, their software on these three compartment model. So once you give a drug, the bolus infusion of the drug, once you give it IV, it normally settles in the central compartment, which is plasma. And then it distributes quickly to the uh, well-perfused organs and slowly equilibrates with the less perfused organs. What's key to note is that it always, elimination always occurs in the central compartment. So drug is given, goes to central compartment, goes to peripheral compartments and still goes back, redistributes back to the central compartment and is finally eliminated. These Ks that are listed in between all these are rate constants. So rate constants are things that determine the distribution and the redistribution of this drug across compartments. If I go to the next diagram, so this, uh, from that compartment model, three compartment model, we generate a log concentration time curve. This basically shows that this drug, ex I mean, there's a exponential decline of the drug concentration. Once you give it in the central compartment, it gets redistributed and it declines. 
And this is governed by these rate constants that are here. So this complex uh, mathematical constants of ensuring that the plasma concentration is in equilibrium with the effect site and still giving clinical effect are what are designed and put in pumps. So for us as clinicians, all we need to do is just put certain covariates and the pump will do all these mathematics, know how much drug was given, how much drug is being distributed and still maintaining a balance between the central compartment and the effect site and still achieving a clinical effect. So the final pharmacokinetic concept that will help us understand this in detail is the adequacy of a target control infusion depends on maintenance of drug levels in the brain, which is the effect site, and drug levels in the plasma, keeping in, in mind all that distribution, redistribution, and elimination, and still maintaining a certain level of uh, drug in the plasma. Uh, so these dedicated pharmacokinetic pumps that are available in the market solve these complex mathematical equations describing this drug distribution, redistribution, and still maintaining effect site concentrations within desired clin clinical effect. So the TCI system, what are the components? So a normal pump, uh, infusion pump, just has a user interface and the microprocessor with pharmacokinetic software and all pharmacokinetic softwares available in the market are based on the three compartment model. So this is uh, an example of a manual infusion pump, manual TIVA pump. This was what was used previously, where drugs were just given uh, in mils per hour. And in remifentanil, we used to use charts to determine how much we used to give them, which, which used to be mics per kg per minute. So this is a modern TCI pump. And you can see here on the screen is a user interface. And CET is the effect site concentration. You can also have CP, which means plasma, site concentration. And once I discuss the models, you'll understand what those two concepts mean. It also shows how much level is maintained. So for instance, in a pump like this, for instance, if you set a certain level uh, of effect site, it will give a rapid bolus and then pause and then maintain a gradient between the effect site, which is the brain and the plasma, and then the levels will slowly drop on their own. So it's more of a smarter pump than the manual TIVA pumps. People are slowly moving away from the TIVA pumps, manual TIVA pumps, because most of the times when we give a dose, we don't know how much effect, effect uh, is in effect site concentration is there. Similarly, if you don't give a loading bol bolus, by the time it's getting to a steady state concentration, you're pretty much lost in the dark, but they still have utility uh, because of our resource setting. So previous regimens that were used manually were like the Bristol regimen, where you started with a high concentration, then slowly came down. And you could titrate in between based on the hemodynamics of the patient. But I've said alluded, I've alluded before that the problem with this is the risk of underdosing. And if no loading dose is given, uh, you never get to what you may think that you're giving enough anesthetic, but maybe you're not. And then there's that risk of overdosing, maintaining just a fixed rate without effect site concentration monitoring. So these smart pumps that we have currently in the market uh, have that good pharmacokinetic software, tells us, it tells us exactly what we're doing, similar to the volatile anesthetics, which the sampling lines tell us are the end tidal concentration of the volatile that we're giving. So I'll get We'll dive in right into the models that are currently available. So there's no evidence available showing any model being superior to the other. All of them are very reliable in predicting plasma site drug levels and brain drug levels. The only point to note is that all these models available were developed in very young, healthy, nano obese patients. So anytime you choose to use TIVA or TCI, you should be very cautious if the patient is very young. By very young, I mean patients less than 16 years of age. If they are way older uh, and very sick patients and morbidly obese patients who have a BMI of more than 42. So all the models available don't cater for that, but they're emerging models that are showing promise for this particular patient uh, cohort. So the adult TCI models, I'll only talk about the two ideal drugs, which is propofol and remifentanil. And those are basically all the models that are used. 
So the adult TCI models, there's, uh, for propofol, there's MASH and the modified MASH model. So the MASH model is very popular with uh, many of our colleagues worldwide, and it can either use plasma or effect site targeting. By plasma, it means once you give the bolus of drug, it stays in V1. So the, in the MASH model, that V1 that I showed you in that previous diagram here. So once you give the bolus of drug, the MASH model assumes a very large V1. What does that mean? Before it achieves a, a concentration gradient between here and the effect site, we need to give very large boluses of propofol. People previously thought that that was a good thing, but people are moving away from that because once you give large boluses of propofol, we know all that does the BP. It causes, uh, it uh, causes, affects the SVR, systemic vascular resistance, and causes lots of hypotension. So for older frail patients, it's better to start at a low plasma concentration of uh, propofol. So that's, what call, what's, that's what's called the modified MASH model. So MASH effect site mode, pretty much, modified MASH helps avoid excessively large loading doses of propofol. So I think the take home is just remembering that MASH assumes a very large V1. And if you're using it, especially if you're doing plasma or effect site, uh, start at a low concentration rather than the generic uh, doses that are given. The second propofol adult model is the Schneider model. So the Schneider model uh, is used in patients who are above 61, 16 years of age. And back to this diagram, which we'll keep alluding to a lot, it assumes a very small V1, meaning you don't need to give too much propofol for you to get an effect site, I mean, plasma effect site a concentration gradient. So Schneider is quite popular. And to be honest, by default, it's what most people are using. And the only recommended mode for Schneider is effect site dosing. We don't use it for a plasma site, reason being, it's never, because of the assuming a small V1, we never end up giving too high doses of propofol. So the models uh, as per the softwares and how the pumps are created, if you're using Schneider, it's only recommended to be used in a uh, effect side dosing. And it's very great for very sick patients where less hemodynamic uh, stability can be withstood. The pediatric TCI models available for propofol are PID fuser and Cantaria. Uh, so the only thing to remember for PEDs, they have larger compartment volumes uh, than adults. So larger propofol doses are used, especially at the beginning, before you get a good plasma concentration. So what that does is at emergence, because the peripheral compartments have more of propofol, regaining of consciousness is uh, much, much, much longer. So this beats purpose of using TCI in like daycare for PEDs, because then again, you'll still be hanging around waiting for the kid to wake up. Effect site targeting is not yet being implemented in uh, pediatric TCI systems. So we only have plasma, plasma site targeting for all pediatric TCI models, which is Pitfusa and Cantaria for propofol. There's a new, there's a new model coming up, a new TCI model coming, coming up, only that it's not been uh, validated. Uh, the beauty about this one, it's good for kids, for very frail patients, for morbidly obese patients, but it's showing promise. It's called the Eleveld. Hopefully in the future, we'll be learning more and more about this. The only TCI model available for remifentanil is the Minto model. It's only validated for kids above 12 years and weighing above 30 kgs. So the covariates that you uh, put in are those, and it can be used in either mode, plasma or effect site mode. However, if you use Minto on effect site, uh, you end up giving three to four times the dose than if you use it on plasma site. What does that mean? You get more side effects of remifentanil, like uh, chest wall rigidity, bradycardia. So if you're using Minto, what they recommend is use it on plasma mode. Or if you're using it on effect site and you're brave and bold, use it on incremental effect site, meaning you start at a small dose and you titrate upwards slowly. So there is no, so that's, that's it for the pharmacokinetics. Um, the dose that you choose when using TCI, how do you choose the appropriate dose? So there's no appropriate dose for all patients, similar to just when we're using, when we're doing our own general anesthetic, uh, balanced anesthetic technique. And the factors that determine 
what dose you give are what I've listed. So there's inter-individual variation. What you'll give for a young patient is not the same thing you'll give for an old patient. What uh, you'll give for a fit AC1 patient is not what you'll give for a critically unwell patient. And then if you've convinced that other drugs, things like opioids, ketamine, alpha-2 agonists like dexmedetomidine or clonidine, then you end up giving much less and setting much less on your TCI pumps. And then also you have to factor in the degree of surgical stimulus. Is there a regional block on board? Because this generally reduces uh, the amount of anesthetic we're using. So the typical doses they normally say, the ones in the books are uh, four for propofol, four mics per meal for propofol, regardless of the mode that you're using, either Marsh or Schneider. And if you're on Remy, four mics, four nanograms per meal, which is just Minto. But now that's just a ballpark figure. You will titrate it based on what we've discussed before, in terms of individual variation, whether you've given other drugs and how much stimulus you're getting at that particular point. So today, uh, my colleague, JK, Jimmy Kabugi, was doing an uh, anesthetic for a very sick 90-year-old. Hopefully, he's in the forum, uh, who had a, very, uh, a low EF fraction of around 20%, and he'd given a block. So the degree of stimulus uh, was not so much because now the pain had already been eliminated as part of his multimodal analgesic uh, technique. This is in Aga Khan today. And you can see here from the pumps, uh, this is propofol on top, and this is remifentanil on top, uh, on the bottom. And the concentrations on the pump, if you can zoom in, are effect site of like 1.5 nanograms, uh, micrograms per mil, and here it's 1.5 nanograms per mil. Remember I say the default figure is four, four, four micrograms per mil for propofol and four for Remy. But in this particular patient, he couldn't use that because even when he was using this one, 1.5, 1.5, he's still getting low BPs. So you have to factor your anesthetic based on the patient that you have on the table. There are safety aspects on the safe use of TIVA and TCI and things we have to remember. And there's a guideline that's been written by the Safe Anesthesia Liaison Group. And there are things that they've said that you have to do if you want to give TIVA or TCI in a safe fashion. So the NAP5 report that I alluded to earlier, the National Audit Project Report, said one of the biggest complications and why most anesthesiologists in the West, and even here, avoid TIVA only as an anesthetic is because of that risk of awareness. And this is more when we're using muscle relaxants. So the recommendation is if you're using a neuromuscular blocker, uh, beyond your vigilance, you need to have EEG monitoring, which is uh, maybe a BIS or any form of uh, modified EEG monitor to avoid awareness at, uh, as much as possible. The highest cases of awareness are normally reported at the end, at emergence. When people switch off the infusions, uh, the surgeon has finished, and the patient still has some neuro, uh, residual neuromuscular blockade on top. So if you're using TIVA TCI and you have a neuromuscular blocker, uh, just stop the hypnotics at the, at the right time. Also, we have to use pump models that are known to staff. So if, in, if a department, for instance, buys BD pumps or buys Fresenius pumps, so that I don't sound like I'm endorsing too much, those pumps need to be known to the staff. And they need, the staff need to be educated about the alarm systems, uh, how the pump goes off, when there's an empty syringe, how to load, reload, also to help uh, maintain the pump, the pumps, because these pumps are quite expensive. And then if you're using TIVA TCI, you need to stick to a singular drug concentration. So if you're using, for instance, uh, propofol, if it's propofol 1%, stick to propofol 1%. Don't mix propofol and propofol 2%. Or if it's Remy, the department just needs to have one particular concentration. This helps reduce drug errors. And then there are specific TIVA infusion sets, which I'll show you, that help prevent uh, reflux of drug and just promote one-way flow of the drug. And this helps that the anesthetic is always being delivered at any one particular time. They say that the cannula, the intravenous cannula that you use throughout a TCI infusion should be visible wherever possible throughout the anesthetic. You also need to flash lines at the end of the anesthetic when you're using TIVA TCI, because if there are residual drugs and a patient is in recovery and receives those drugs, they might end up having uh, side effects. Uh, so there's no special informed consent that's needed for TIVA TCI use, because unpackaging all that during a consenting process can be quite unsettling to the patient. 
So as long as best practice and safe practice is upheld, uh, you can just proceed with TIVA TCI without necessarily giving any extra consent for it. So those are the TIVA infusion sets that I was telling you about that should be ideally used when you're using TIVA or TCI. They have one-way valves and just promote one-way flow of the drug. So TIVA TCI doesn't come without its own problems. So there are problems and that's why maybe it's not as popular as it should be. The biggest problem uh, in actually everywhere is the cost of these pumps. But I know in the future, with more manufacturers coming into the market, the cost of these pumps will become much, much more cheaper. And then there's that risk of awareness. And mostly I said it's at emergence and they're mostly technical errors. And these are very preventable with proper training and just repeated CMEs, departmental CMEs. And then the very fat patients, the very patients, patients with, who are morbidly obese, uh, TIVA TCI is not recommended. So the MASH model is only limited to 150 kgs, Schneider to BMIs of 35 to 42, and the formulas that are used in the pumps, in the microprocessors of those pumps, in the pharmacokinetic microprocessors of those pumps, the pump software, all those formulas, the only validated one is the Savins formula. They've used the James formula, but the Savins is what shows promise. So if you have a morbidly obese patient above 150 kgs, then maybe you don't need to use TIVA TCI as per our knowledge right now. And then there's a the risk of hyperalgesia after remifentanil use. So a lot has been tried, uh, but what we normally do is uh, maybe give morphine 30 minutes prior to the end of the case. And that normally helps deal with the hyperalgesia. But there are many, there are many uh, therapies. Uh, let me not get into that. And then there's risk of propofol infusion syndrome. So this is a rare uh, fatal condition that happens when you give large doses of propofol and it causes rhabdomyolysis, uh, uh, myoglobinuria. But it's normally in patients with uh, mitochondrial diseases and they say most commonly in kids. So from all the literature, there's only three case reports of unexplained metabolic acidosis reported during TIVA TCI use, but they never had any other features of PRIS. So it's starting to look like a phantom condition, like a malignant hypothermia. So what's the future of TCI and what are the possible trends? So TCI definitely will pick up in its use. In the West, they've only used it for 20 years. And I know here we are going to be using it much, much more in the future. So the pump models will be optimized. We talked about the elevated TCI model that's coming up and it's cutting across all patient populations. I know we'll be seeing more and more of this uh, coming up now. Then there'll be increased uh, interactions between pump manufacturers and pharmaceutical companies because more and more clinicians are asking for more drugs. So the pumps normally don't have too many drugs. They only have propofol, remy, maybe ketamine, but there are more and more drugs that are even more beneficial like dexmedetomidine, that are still not in these pumps. And I know we'll be seeing them much more uh, in the future. And then we'll be having now standardized real-time reporting from these devices to the anesthesia management systems. So that what you're giving in the pump is being recorded and all you need to do is just focus on your anesthetic and just be vigilant. So there'll be human and machine vigilance. And this I'm sure our trends will be seeing in the future. So in conclusion, TIVA and TCI can be done safely uh, as long as you understand the pharmacokinetics underpinning its practice and you stick to the guidelines ensuring safe delivery of this technique. You should only be very cautious currently with very young kids, very sick people and morbidly obese patients. MASH, you can use it. The MASH model, the propofol models are MASH and Schneider, that's for adults. The MASH is either plasma or effect, but just remember the large V1, so use lower concentrations, modified mash, lower concentrations, and then you titrate up slowly. Schneider is only effect site targeting only. And remifentanil, the plasma site targeting is the safest. And any child above 60 kgs, you can use any of the adult, adult uh, models. Thank you. It's the end of my talk. Tim. All right. Uh... Thank you so much, Dr. Waduwingi. That I think we don't agree that was a very informative uh, talk. Uh, and thanks so much for the new knowledge you've given us. Um, so I think I'll take a few questions. Um, 
we would prefer if the questions are posted in the chat box, so everyone can see. However, if you really want to be heard, please uh, raise your hand and I think our admin will uh, unmute you. So I have two questions uh, currently in the chat box. Um, let me just look for them. Yeah, so Waringi, uh, someone is asking, um, in patients with liver disease uh, or renal disease, how do TCI models take this into account? Uh, and then number two, is there uh, a reason why there aren't any effect site TCI models for pediatric populations? I think I'll let you take those two questions. Uh, thanks, Tim. So I'll start with the first one. So patients with liver disease and kidney disease, you said, and whether TCI models take this into account. So now this is what I was saying, like at the point when you're dosing your drugs, at the point when you're dosing your drugs, you have to look at inter-individual variations. If the patient is quite unwell and they have liver and kidney disease, you just have to titrate your anesthetic slowly upwards uh, based on those two conditions. But the models don't, you don't, that interface on the pump, it doesn't have that covariate of liver or renal. That's up to the physician themselves to know that my patient has liver or renal disease and you know how to titrate the doses slowly. For pediatrics, why aren't there any effect site models? I think it's just our current knowledge for now. I'm sure the pumps that will come later, uh, they'll be having effect site TCI uh, models. I don't think there's any particular reason unless unless it's a pediatric anesthesiologist who has more experience in that, maybe I'll give them uh, to answer. Um, all right. Uh, so there are a few more questions. Uh, what should be the best dimensions of a typical infusion pump? Uh, and do you know any studies regarding failure of medical devices leading to injury or death of a patient? So the best pump is the safest pump and that that's known to the clinician. So, uh, I mean, there are many brands in the market. Um, so there's Fresenius, there's BD, there's Alaris. So it really depends on one, the budget of the department, two, what is known to the uh, anesthesiologist and three, what you can deliver safely. But even a simple pump, as long as you're safe and you know how to use it, that's the best pump. Right, fair enough. Um, so the question here asking whether manual infusion pumps, uh, I think it's at the Tiva pumps, whether there are, whether there are uh, a good alternative cons uh, where TCI pumps are costly. And I think maybe just to add on, onto that question, for those of us who do not have TCI pumps, uh, could you give us a breakdown of the Bristol regimen that we can use for the Tiva? Good. So the Tiva pumps team are what we've been using. Even I trained myself with Tiva pumps. I still use them once in a while when I don't want to do the lots of mathematics. But the Tiva pumps, are they're just as useful. And as long as you know how to use them, they're just as effective. And we use them a lot, especially like in cardiac anesthesia. The Bristol regimen was what, that's, that's now for the manual infusion where you start at, uh, let me close this. So where you start at 10 milligrams. So once you load up the pump, you start at 10 milligrams and then slowly titrate, maybe like after 10 minutes to eight milligrams per kg, then six milligrams per kg per hour. That's for propofol. But remifentanil, you just have to use a chart. That's in the dose being 0 0.1 mics per kg per minute upwards until 0 0.7 mics per kg per minute. Still looking at the hemodynamics. So this again is not cast in stone. It still depends on the patient who's in front of you on the table. So these are just algorithms. So ultimately the honors will be with the patient you have. Are they very sick? Are they young? Are they fit? Or even if they are young, are they robust or they are young and frail? So you have to titrate that based on what you have on the table. All right, uh, a few more questions here. So. Um... Someone is asking, is uh, TIVA more suitable for some operations and not others? And do you use TIVA for all uh, says craniotomies or all CSs? So basically I think the question is which 
uh, patient populations would benefit from TIVA? So for obstetrics, I'll start with the final question. For obstetrics, um, obstetrics, if you're using TIVA, I'm, I'm assuming that's GA for CS. So GA for CS normally, if it's not the patient choice, it's normally a category one emergency. So you're crashing in because the decision to deliver a time needs to be within 30 minutes. That's the definition of a category one. So GA for CS, 30 minutes by the time you're loading up with the pump, I think that's a lot of faffing. So they've not done a lot of TCI for obstetrics unless you are preempt, unless it's a category two and you want to give it a go. However, uh, the patient populations that benefit a lot are neurosurgical patients where you really need to tightly control the hemodynamics and adjust it accordingly. So that TIVA and TCI has a lot of benefit. ENT patients, things like faces where risk of bleeding is high and you really need to titrate and tighten the BP control. There's a lot of promise in that and TCI can be used in those patient populations. All right, thank you for that. So um, there's a question about what, what would your, your comment be about the use of TIVA in low resource setting? Sorry, Tim. What, would, what is your comment on the use of TIVA in low resource setting? Um, so TIVA still has utility in low resource settings, uh, like I've just said like neurosurgical patients, ENT patients, and uh, it's, it'll have a lot of utility. For instance, uh, there's a lot of, uh, let me pick uh, an example. There's a lot of spine surgery that's coming up and more and more of, uh, orthopedic surgeons are doing more and more spine surgery. And we need to do neurophysiological monitoring with that. TIVA TCI is wonderful in that. So as long as the pumps are well-priced, there's utility in many disciplines and more emerging disciplines like spine surgery, and they have said neurosurgery, ENT, so there's a lot of utility, as long as the pumps are made more affordable. Uh, awesome. Okay, maybe just one more question, and then I think we can go to uh, our uh, somebody from BD. Uh, you had mentioned about hyperalgesia from Remy Fentanyl. So, are there any tips, any other tips you can give us apart from um, the timing of morphine or any other opiate that you want to give post op? Um, so hyperalgesia team, uh, post fentanyl, that's a broad topic. And mm. many, many, many things have been tried. Ketamine, rescue fentanyl, propofol, a lot of uh, uh, therapies. I personally use in my practice, it's not cast on stone, I use the morphine one. But um, I think that one, uh, guys just have to check that up because there's, a, there's hyperalgesia, we still don't know, we still don't have an answer to how to treat remifentanil post-op hypalgesia, hypalgesia post-remifentanil use. All right, thank you so much. So I think uh, from here, we will have a short presentation from our sponsors of the day. This is BD Medical. Uh, and I think I'll invite uh, Zenobia Rama. Uh, subsequent to that, maybe we can have a few more questions if there'll be time. Uh, and then we'll uh, give our closing remarks. Good, ev good evening, everybody, and thank you so much, Dr. Werungi, for that insightful presentation. Uh, each time I listen to the TCI, uh, I always learn something, and I've learned quite a bit from you, gathered quite a bit from you. Can every anybody, can you see my screen? Um, no, we cannot see your screen. Okay, there we go. Yeah, now it's on. Uh, yep. So uh, thank you for joining our TCI TIVA webinar led uh, so well and professionally and with so much so insightful from Dr. Warungi. We, really, we really do appreciate that. Uh, just a brief overview. You all know BD very well. Uh, I would like to just go through to just the next, our next slide. and just share with you and, 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 and just to highlight that BD is united in our purpose of advancing the world of health, uh, not, and particularly in the area of um, medication management, be it in anesthesia, be it in uh, critical care areas. Um, 
I don't want to bore you with uh, the global position of BD, but I want to remind you that BD is a legacy uh, as a legacy company has impacted the health globally, being founded in 1897, and we continue to be innovative and put in a lot of investment into innovative solutions. When we look at the um, broad spectrum of what we cover and how we serve the, in the healthcare segments and facilities, we serve the laboratories in our life sciences, in both in discovering new vaccines, the diagnostic uh, on the diagnostic side as well, and then on med on the medical side is really focused on medication management. You know, uh, Dr. Warungi spoke about cannulation having the right cannula, having those right extension sets uh, that with an anti-siphon valve, all in the interest of patient safety, uh, with the right correct devices, and irrespective of which device you use, understanding the device is, is, is so important. And there are safety aspects to our uh, TC, our, our pharmacokinetic pump. So our pumps are called PK pump, and that's specifically designed for pharmacokinetics. And it has an interchangeable TIVA, you know, both for TCI and TIVA. So they, it's, it's, it's quite functional. And I'm not talking to you really about the product, but I'd like to also share with you our focus on our in, in strategic um, intent uh, being the center and purpose of everything that we do. Firstly, is reshaping medication management across the continuum of care, preventing infections and improving safety, both for you as healthcare professionals, as well as for our, our patients, and ultimately advancing the treatment of diseases. The next thing I'd like to say, just to before I conclude and say thank you to everybody, is let's, if we look back into history, and we see how far we have come along the timeline of anesthesia since 1540 AD. And right now today we are sitting with smart devices, smart devices with algorithms. And I would like to share with you that this, this pump was developed by anesthetists for anesthetists. And it started off with a TIVA pump and went on to move on to a pharmacokinetic pump to enhance the outcomes of anesthesia. So you have both the TCI as well as the TIVA functionality on the pumps today. And with that, I would like to say by using the pumps, the smart pumps for pharmacokinetic smart pumps, we're really looking at a patient-centric procedure. And, and then Dr. Warungi already alluded to the indications for TCI. However, the benefit both for the patient as well as for the healthcare facility is the turnaround time. You know, the, the patient wakes up quicker. Uh, there's the reduced risk of um, post-operative complications, particularly with uh, post-operative uh, nausea. Uh, it it's improves the predictability and the pharmacodynamic effect. And it keeps, once that bolus is given, like, you know, you, with the induction, like Dr. Warundi said, you have the patient in the maintenance level, keeping them at a steady state and then preventing overdose during induction, which is the initial bolus, and thus preventing respiratory depression. So the outcomes really are patient-centric. Uh, think about a patient waking up sooner. You don't have to stand at the bedside of the patient and waiting for the patient to wake up. Patients on daycare for daycare surgery, after the two hours, three hours, they can get up and eat and they can leave hospital. So it reduces the, the occupancy and the length of stay in the hospital. So you can have more patients, a higher turnover. You could actually do more theater cases in one day than you would with volatile gas. So with that, I want to say 
a very hearty felt thank you to all of you for joining this webinar. Thank you to the KSA um, uh, Society, the um, uh, Anesthesia Society uh, of Kenya for allowing us and giving us the opportunity to add to and uh, to share and build capabilities and share information and knowledge by providing us with the opportunity to host this web webinar. So once again, thank you to the hosts and thank you to our guest speaker, Dr. Warengi. I appreciate and thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening and enjoy your conference further. All right, thanks so much Zenobia and uh, BD for your continued support for all KSA activities. Um, I'll take any more questions if they're there, either for Daktari or for Zenobia. Um, what okay. I would like to perhaps add, uh, if, so if you do not mind, Dr. B, sure. uh, I'd like to just add that Festus and Monala at your disposal. Festus is a clinical support in East Africa. Should you want to have a look at anything or you want to discuss anything, uh, we will continue to invite you from South Africa when we host our next uh, session, which is coming up. We're going to be speaking about a malignant hypothermia. We have a specialist on malignant hypothermia. Uh, and uh, we will also have uh, uh, Dr. Welsh speaking on um, uh, uh, revisiting the TCI in a very practical manner and linking with the, with the hypo, uh, malignant hypothermia. So we will share that invite with you and we look forward to continued partnership with all of you. So take care, good night, and God bless and asante sane. All right, thanks so much, Zenobia. Um, while we have you, there's somebody asking what the cost of a TCI machine is. Is that something you can answer for us? Festus, I think Festus is in the plenary. Cost of the TCI pump. Um, okay, maybe you can drop a drop a drop a reply in the chat box and we can share with the with the participants um all right there don't there don't seem to be any more questions oh Warengi, there's one more question for you somebody's asking um what's your experience with proper fall and uh, uh mri imaging in children so i've used i've used uh, proper fall for mris and i've also used T tiva for MRI delivery. The only thing is that you need to be careful. You have to have very long extension lines. If they get occluded by that, uh, the door, there's always a problem. And then the pumps, there's normally a line because once the pump passes the 50 gauze line, gauze is what, G -A -U -S -S, is what measures the magnetic capability of those pumps. So beyond there, those pumps malfunction. So there's normally a line and you can connect long infusion pumps and use Propofol. So you can either choose to give the manual doses of Propofol once you're inside the MRI or use the pump, but ensure you don't pass the 50 goals line because otherwise you'll mess up the pump. And have long right. extension. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. There'll be no, no other questions. I think we'll do some housekeeping. So for those asking about the presentation, uh, this is a, a webinar that's being recorded and will be made available on the KSA website and on YouTube uh, sometime tomorrow. Uh, so there are some announcements to be made. Uh, I think first I'll, in, I'll invite Dr. Nganga, uh, one of our executive committee officials, just to make an announcement and then I'll, I'll close up. Dr. Nganga. Uh, thanks, thanks Dr. Kanyeki for, for, for this opportunity and also thanks to Dr. Waringe for that uh, very informative uh, presentation. Uh, TIVA is uh, TIVA TCA is uh, uh, growing very rapidly, and especially as we do more and more daycare surgery. So this is knowledge that uh, is really uh, important, and uh, it's timely uh, as at, at this moment. Uh, also, thanks to to KSA for uh, facilitating this uh, this uh, hosting this presentation, and of course our very 
uh, generous uh, uh, facilitators, uh, BD, for making this possible. Uh, just two announcements. One is to invite you all, all of you to register for the, the KSA, Critical Care Society of Kenya, uh, annual conference. Uh, this year, we are going fully virtual. This is the 28th KSA and the 8th Critical Care Society of Kenya annual scientific conference. Uh, you, you can register uh, online and uh, all the information is uh, right there and it, it's a very easy and straightforward uh, procedure so you're all welcome uh, and uh, please go ahead and, and register the other announcement is the, is that uh, the office will be closed from monday the case office at the kme center because of uh, uh, safe bids training that's happening in Mombasa, and KSA is uh, involved in the KSA administration is involved in organizing for for that. But uh, the administ the office administrator will be available on phone and email to respond to any queries that uh, anyone any of the members or our other partners uh, may have. So you can reach to her through the KSA phone and uh, email, all of which are available on our uh, website. Uh, I think that's the much I had to say for now. Thanks a lot for everyone for coming. I hand over to Dr. Kanyeki. Kanyeki. All right. Thank you, Dr. Terry. Um, right. So just a few more issues. Uh, so like I, like we mentioned, this is a recorded uh, webinar. It will be available on the website and on YouTube. Uh, CPDs will be sent to our respective emails. And for our highlight members, uh, certificates will be sent to to your emails as well. Uh, a big thank you to our international uh, participants. Uh, we always uh, happy to have you on board. Uh, and, and again, certificates will be sent to your emails. Um, the next webinar will be next week on the 17th of June. Uh, so something to look forward to. Yeah, and uh, I see Festas has posted uh, his email address up there in case there are any more queries to BD. So the email is festas.kamau at bd.com. That's festus.kamau at bd.com. Uh, again, so many thanks to the organizers of these uh, webinars. We really appreciate the efforts you put towards uh, uh, improving uh, educational content. Uh, and many thanks again to all to who, all who managed to uh, join us for today's uh, webinar. So with that, uh, we bid you a good evening. All right.